For many years, fans of Rockstar Games have recognized the famous voices of some of their favorite characters. Everyone from Michael Rapport as Joey Leone, to Gary Busey as Phil Cassidy, to Samuel L. Jackson as Frank Tenpenny, to Phil Collins as Phil Collins. These voices certainly bring their characters to life, but it seems that not all of those who provided the voices were particularly happy with their experience of working with Rockstar. Not only that, but the people at Rockstar themselves weren't that happy with working with some of the voiceover talent either, and this is part of the reason why a big change was made in the way that Rockstar goes about hiring actors for their roles. Let's start by going back in time to 2001. Grand Theft Auto 3 was well into production, and it was time to begin hiring voice actors for the characters in this video game. They wanted to use celebrities in the game, and hired everyone from Michael Madsen to Kyle MacLachlan to Frank Vincent, who had previously been in films like Goodfellas and Casino. Great actor, plenty of memorable roles, but video games at the time were something of an anomaly to a lot of film and TV actors. And a lot of them, especially the older ones, probably didn't know much of anything about video games. And Frank Vincent made that pretty clear. According to the book Jacked by David Kushner, upon walking into the recording studio, the first thing he said to the Rockstar staff was, I don't know sh about video games, I don't know what the f this is. Navid Kansari, the director of the voiceover sessions, let him know that it's basically no different from a movie. I don't think there were any issues with Vincent after that, and I feel like more than likely he was just a little confused about the whole thing at the beginning. I mean, he was 64 years old in 2001, you could forgive him for not being entirely sure about what this was all about, but when he realized that it's basically voice acting, he was probably fine with it. If he really gave them a tough time, I doubt they would have brought him back twice to reprise his role as Salvatore Leone. I just wanted to tell that story because I read it in the book and I thought it was pretty funny. It could have been worse. He could have told Dan Hauser to go home and get his f***ing shine box. While Frank Vincent came back to play Salvatore Leone in both San Andreas and Liberty City stories, Michael Madsen didn't reprise his role as Sal's underboss, Tony Cipriani, when that character was made into a protagonist in Liberty City stories. I can't find exactly why he didn't return, but given how Liberty City Stories was clearly a much lower budget title than Vice City and San Andreas, maybe they just didn't feel that having to pay Michael Madsen to play a top role was within their budget when all this was at the time was just a PSP exclusive title. The first handheld GTA since GTA Advance, and one they were probably hoping wouldn't flop this time. Another character from GTA 3, who I always felt should have returned in another game but didn't, was Luigi Gortelli, played by Joe Pantoliano. But there might be a reason why he didn't return. According to Rolling Stone magazine, Pantoliano once regretted doing GTA 3 because he thought it was too violent and he has kids. This, coming from the guy who played Ralph Cifaretto. I mean, I guess he had no problem with that time he was on screen as that character beating a pregnant prostitute to death. I know, it's all make-believe, but in the show, he still kills a woman and her unborn baby. Yeah, it's alright if the kids see that, I guess, right? Hey, she was a hua. It doesn't matter. I don't know. Honestly, I really hope that it was just a joke that was taken out of context by whoever wrote this article. After GTA 3 was released, Vice City's production went full steam ahead. Rockstar's experience in working with celebrities didn't seem like it was too bad in GTA 3, so why not continue to bring celebs into the mix? Not only that, but according to Jack, Sam and Dan Hauser both mentioned how cool they thought it was when TV shows would feature celebrity guest stars each week. Sam Hauser specifically cited Miami Vice as always guest starring random celebrities like Phil Collins, Glenn Fry, and Frank Zappa. So part of it was inspired by Miami Vice. Plus, according to Rockstar Games co-founder Jamie King, they all really wanted to meet their favorite celebrities and they now had the means and a good excuse of being able to do so. Little did they know, this would turn out to be an unfortunate experience for many. Citing this amazing book again, when they decided on Ray Liotta as the choice to play the game's protagonist, Tommy Versetti, it wasn't easy to even get him to be in the game, or at least to get through to him to get him to be in the game. Going by what the book said, Jamie King kept on getting told that Liotta was trying to change his image. After being a wise guy in Goodfellas and doing that crappy movie where he's a psycho on a plane trying to kill the flight attendant and then being fed a chunk of his own brain by Hannibal Lecter, now he wanted to do family movies. But eventually he agreed to be in this video game thing. And the first bad omen came when the rock stars and Leota all met each other for the first time for dinner. They were telling him how much they loved his movies, and then for no reason he went cold in the middle of their conversation and stared them down and said, Why the f are you laughing? They freaked out, and the situation must have become very uncomfortable. Then Leota started laughing and said he was just messing with them. He basically pulled a Joe Pesci on them for no reason whatsoever except for seemingly his own personal enjoyment. 
The voiceover sessions with him weren't much better, and they might have even been worse. To make a long story short, according to Rockstar's employees, Leota acted like a huge diva and they got sick of him pretty fast. In an IGN interview from around the time of the game's release, Leota did tell them that doing Vice City was, quote, actually a lot of fun, and there were some great people on this one and I did my homework on it, I know it's a pretty intense game. He then smiled and added with a laugh, I was trying to go under the radar with it. Under the radar? The writer of this article even flat out wrote, who the hell does he think he's kidding with that under the radar quip anyway? How could he possibly keep a low profile about it? It's almost like he was embarrassed to be in a video game. Oh, and by the way, he does mention that the pay, by his standards at least, was not very good. We don't know exactly how much he made from the role, but obviously it was not as much as what he would make doing a movie. We know that the game's budget was $5 million, and obviously some of that budget goes towards paying the actors. I know that Jenna Jameson, according to Jack, got $5,000 for her role. Now, that might not sound like a lot at all, but you have to remember, Jenna Jameson didn't play the lead role, it was a very minor role, and from the sounds of it, she was only at their studio for a very short amount of time. The only reason she was even in New York to begin with was for an appearance on Howard Stern. All of her lines were probably recorded in a day, so $5,000 for that isn't bad, but it's probably not even close to what Ray Liotta made. Another point that the book makes about what the actors were paid, and specifically Ray Liotta, comes from the game's voiceover director, Navid Kansari. When he was beginning to lose his patience with Liotta's attitude during the recording sessions, Kansari makes a reference to how much Liotta was making. Kansari's father is a doctor, and according to him, Liotta made half of what his father makes in presumably a shorter period of time. Let's just say that his father doesn't make anything less than $150,000 a year. That would mean that Leota made no less than $75,000 for his role as Tommy in a shorter amount of time than a year most likely. I really can't see Leota's meeting and recording sessions lasting longer than a couple of months, if that. But then depending on how long Kansari's father has been a doctor for and depending on what kind of doctor he is, there's a chance that the number could even be higher than that. By the way, in 2008, Sam Hauser told GamesRadar a little bit more about what it was like dealing with Leota. He said that in some sessions, Leota was fired up and really into the role, but then in others, he'd get all emo on them and they couldn't work with him. But he still calls him an amazing actor, but then he also comments on Leota's remarks regarding pay. Hauser said he made some comments later on through his agents, something like, hey, this game was so big, I should have charged more money. And I hate that kind of chat, it's so cheesy. Like he's saying, next time, I'm really going to pin it to them. Well, how about we just killed off your character? There's no next time, that's how we handle that. It's really a shame how everything turned out, though. I loved Vice City and the character of Tommy Versetti. He's practically the reason I even proudly wear Hawaiian shirts. So to learn about what went on behind the scenes and how we acted was disappointing, to say the least. There's videos online of the cast members behind the scenes in the recording studio, and Ray Liotta is noticeably not shown in any of it. Everyone that is shown seems to be having a good time though, some of them even reprise their roles in future games. Like with Frank Vincent in GTA 3, I doubt they would have returned if they didn't get along with the staff. It doesn't seem like anybody had a great time working with Ray, unfortunately. But hey, at least we know he had a great experience playing himself in B-Movie. Another Vice City actor who didn't get along well with Rockstar was none other than Burt Reynolds, who played the role of Avery Carrington. You might remember me mentioning this in one of my previous videos that I looked into a cut part of Vice City's map, which was referenced in a piece of dialogue for Avery that was also cut from the game. Reynolds and Dan Hauser especially did not get along well. Hauser, according to numerous articles and Kushner's book, had kindly asked Reynolds at one point if he could do another take and re-record the lines he had just said. A completely innocent thing that I'm sure happens a lot in the world of voice acting. Reynolds, however, seemed to take offense at this and proclaimed that Hauser needed to give him an attaboy before he was asked to do anything again. I can just imagine Hauser, Kansari, and whoever else from Rockstar was present not knowing what the hell this guy was even talking about, but it got worse. Eventually, a misunderstanding about a new shirt being delivered to Reynolds by his manager after he sweat through the old one had caused him to basically flip out on Dan Hauser, telling him, there's gonna be two hits here, me hitting you and you hitting the floor. Hauser, by this point, completely lost his patience with Reynolds and wanted to cut him from the game entirely, and presumably bring somebody else into play Avery instead. But Kansari intervened and told Hauser, we got the performance, he's a total c**k, but let's move on. Little wonder why when Avery Carrington returned in Liberty City Stories, it was a non-speaking role, the character gets killed off, and then even his death is mocked. You get the impression that they really didn't like Burt Reynolds even three years after they last had to work with him, and they were obviously not about to ask him to come back. 
In 2018, Vulture had an article about the making of Red Dead Redemption 2, and while interviewing Dan Hauser about the game when they were inside Rockstar's recording studios, Hauser brought up Reynolds again. Apparently, Reynolds at one point yelled, Get the limey out of here. Hauser also told Vulture, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, poor bugger, but we don't bring in name actors anymore because of their egos, and most important of all, because we believe we get a better sense of immersion using talented actors whose voices you don't recognize. After the Reynolds incident, Hauser also acknowledged that they had an issue working with Chuck D of Public Enemy during his voiceover work for the playback FM DJ in San Andreas. Hauser didn't get specific about what happened, but whatever did happen, it resulted in Hauser having to ask another director to step in to sort out whatever issues there were between them. Hauser then said, I think rappers really want to do the work right. We also always had a good experience with pop stars, but we haven't used either significantly for a long time. By pop stars, I couldn't help but wonder if part of him is referring to Phil Collins, who appeared as himself in Vice City Stories. It was such an out there but amazing moment when Phil Collins actually becomes a part of the game. According to interviews given in 2006, he had a great time working on the game. It probably helped that Collins himself is already familiar with video games. He's a huge fan of Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon, and in his own words, he spent hours playing both every day non-stop. I wonder if he's played the Reignited Trilogy yet. Oh, who am I kidding? Of course he probably has. By GTA 4, Rockstar did pretty much stop using Hollywood talent to play major roles in the story. Famous people were still in the game, but in smaller roles. Iggy Pop, Julia Lewis, Carl Lagerfeld, among others, played radio DJs, and Ricky Gervais appeared at the comedy club. The game's protagonist, Nico Bellic, was played by Michael Hollick, and obviously we know that afterwards there was some controversy regarding his pay and status with Rockstar. It all originated from a New York Times article published almost a month after the game was released. According to the article, Hollick was paid $100,000 for 15 months of work between late 2006 and early 2008. This work included both voice acting and motion capture. Now, $100,000 is by far no small amount, especially for an aspiring actor like Hollick, who had been working various retail jobs at places like bagel shops and department stores in between small acting gigs prior to playing Nico. But by the time this article was written and published in May of 2008, the game had already made $600 million. It's a huge amount of money compared to 100000 and Hollick, nor any of the other actors in the game, saw any of it because of contracts between the Actors' Union and the entertainment industry that, at the time, made little to no provisions for electronic media such as video games or anything on the internet. So you might be wondering, well, gee, who's at fault here? The Actors' Union for their crappy contracts to begin with and not understanding the video game industry? Or maybe Rockstar for not trying harder to make sure everyone can continue to benefit off the work they put in and enjoy the fruits of their labor a little more. Here's what Hollick had to say. Obviously, I'm incredibly thankful to Rockstar for the opportunity to be in the game when I was just a nobody, an unknown quantity. But it's tough when you see Grand Theft Auto 4 out there as the biggest thing going right now, when they're making hundreds of millions of dollars and we don't see any of it. I don't blame Rockstar. I blame our union for not having the agreements in place to protect the creative people who drive the sales of these games. Yes, the technology is important, but it's the human performances within them that people really connect to, and I hope actors will get more respect for the work they do within those technologies. The article goes on to say that Rockstar declined to comment, but that this is something that has been an issue for a while in the video game industry. Interestingly, Hollick also told the New York Times that he had asked about the possibility of getting residuals when they were negotiating the contract, but that he was told that this wouldn't be a possibility. Now, I'm not an expert on actors' unions, but it seems like that's what Hollick is blaming. Not Rockstar Games, but his own union. If he felt that Rockstar had ripped him off or underpaid him, he wouldn't have said that he's not mad at them, would he? I know some of you might ask, well, if it's impossible for Rockstar to pay him royalties, couldn't they just give him more than $100,000? And my answer to that would be, I don't know. Maybe they could have, maybe they wouldn't. If anyone watching this does have any familiarity with how actors' unions and negotiations work, do let us know what could have possibly been done differently, if anything could have been done differently. I'm starting to feel that royalties are really where the biggest problems lie in all of this. Since Hollick never complained about being underpaid for the initial work that was done, before we move on, there's one more point I wanted to make about Michael Hollick. In 2010, Laszlo had a Q&A session in which he was asked about Hollick. He even acknowledged that Hollick was not upset about the pay. The, the main actor um, did an interview with the New York Times and uh, did a, a phenomenal interview. And then towards the end, they asked him, you know, how much are you getting paid and all these kind of questions. Um, and he sort of got sandbagged. And then the article came out, oh, he's not happy with his pay, uh, which was 
not the case at all. Um, Mike's an awesome guy, and we're still working with him. I find the fact that he said that they were still working with Holic by that time to be interesting. Holic only appears in the credits for GTA 4, and the only video game work he's done after that that he was credited for was some motion capture work for Homefront, and then a voice role in Dying Light. And I somehow doubt that still working with them meant that they were recycling one of his pain noises from GTA 4 for Max Payne 3. If Laszlo's claim is true, then whatever they wanted to work with him on clearly never materialized. Laszlo also said that he doesn't feel sorry for many actors who come in wanting to be treated like royalty, because the real stars according to him are the people working behind the scenes, and that people aren't playing a video game just for an actor. Laszlo then goes on to say that Hollywood simply can't get around the fact that video games are different. His response is really interesting, in fact the entire Q&A is, and I put a link to the full video in the description. Now let's move on to one final person who voiced a very prominent role in GTA San Andreas, Young Melee. I'm sure by now many of us have seen the comments he posted on his Instagram page about his feelings for Rockstar. He doesn't really go into detail about exactly what the hell the problem is 15 years after San Andreas, but he does keep on ranting and arguing with people and being oddly aggressive. Now, in one of the comments, he accuses Rockstar of being culture vultures from London who make billions of dollars, and that nobody they work with, himself included, has seen 10% of that. Does Melee's issue have to do with royalties as well? If so, you might be asking now, is there a reason why he came out about this now and not 15 years ago? I mean, Ray Liotta and Michael Hollick both made their frustrations clear within a month of each game's release. But that's not to say that Young Melee didn't have issues with them for a while either. In a post he made in August of 2019, he still refers to them as culture vultures. He may have still had his own issues with them for a long time, but he just chose to not be public about it until recently. Young Melee isn't being any more specific on what exactly his problem is with them, other than he really wants people to know how much he hates them. Could something have happened recently that set him off? My own suggestion would be that maybe Young Melee just finally got pissed off after all these years of people calling him CJ or asking him about CJ or making CJ related comments almost every day. Seriously, just look at any video of his on YouTube or anything he posts on social media. 90% of the comments left for him are about CJ or some kind of reference to San Andreas. Everywhere you look, CJ, 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 CJ. Oh, here's an innocent comment. Oh, never mind. It's like for every 100 comments, there's maybe three that actually care about his music. And it's just as bad on Instagram. He made a post on the birthday of someone he knew, hip-hop producer and DJ Crazy Tunes, who passed away a few years ago, and the first comments you see are San Andreas memes. He posts a picture of a dog and Big Smoke somehow gets pulled into the conversation too. Melee's cousin, Sean Fantino, did a recent Instagram broadcast where he explained that at a lot of conventions he attends, he gets lobbed all these questions by people asking him about GTA 6 and how he basically just gives them what they want to hear, even though he himself has no knowledge of anything that Rockstar is doing. And when they ask me about GTA 6 and they say, you know, are you coming back in it or are you going to be in it? If you guys really listen, listen, if y'all motherfuckers really listen to the, to the interviews and shit, it'd be a joke in me. I would love to be in GTA 6, hell yeah, you know what I'm saying? And what y'all think about, you know, CJ might come back, you know, and blah, 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 this and blah, blah, that. We're going to come back and take over um, Grove Street, you know? Them be just me just speaking out, having fun with the crowd, interacting. Giving them what they want to hear, but also giving them, you know, the, the, uh, whatever the f it is, but I'll just be having fun, man. Fontino's just playing with the audience, who takes it literally, and then every other blogger and YouTuber just picks it up, runs with it, and makes breaking news, CJ returning for GTA 6 videos. Which probably led to even more people flooding Melee's inbox, bugging him about something that's completely irrelevant to him. I got up this morning just to speak on this because I want y'all to stop it, man. Leave Melee the f*** alone, man. Leave him alone, man. Let him live, man. He alright. He venting on some s*** that he had in him for a long time ago. It ain't for me to speak on what it is. Maybe he'll get on his live and speak on it. And maybe he won't. I hope he don't because, like I said, he, he might, you know, he's still a little more active than I am. So he might say some s***. He might regret it again. But... Be the man alone, man. You know, y'all filling this DM up with all this sick shit. And then y'all putting shit on YouTube where when I did some shit at in Brazil 
And I said, yeah, you know, CJ might be coming back to the six, man. You know, man, listen to the f***ing words that I say before y'all start taking them and chopping them up. It say might. And yeah, I would love it. Yeah, it's, I have no knowledge of DLC. I have no knowledge of online content. I have no knowledge on what the f***ing Rockstar is doing in their office, their time, in their building, their writers, their programmers. I have zero knowledge. They don't tell me sh And there you have it. The many different voice actors who have worked with Rockstar and the opinions that they and those within Rockstar are known to have of each other. For some, it's fairly obvious what the issues are. In the case of Burt Reynolds and Ray Liotta, I think they were just too Hollywood for it and they probably saw doing video game voice work as being beneath them. They simply weren't fun to work with. And for Michael Hollick, I think his issues mostly had to do with royalties and the actors' unions, not with Rockstar or what they paid him initially. Of course, immediately afterwards, everybody gets the impression that he just hates Rockstar and that they must have paid him next to nothing for his role, and this is the narrative that seemed to stick for a long time. And with Young Melee, it probably had to do with both the lack of royalties and maybe the fact that he's getting bugged by people non-stop about stuff he doesn't know or care about. But we're just going by what we can see, we don't really know. However, it does seem like there is an issue with royalty payments for video game voice actors or the lack of royalty payments for video game voice actors. Like I said, this is a really difficult issue, and it's one that still isn't over. In 2016, video game voice actors went on strike against almost a dozen video game developers and publishers, including Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two Interactive. The strike was over a failure in contract renegotiations, and that the voice actors and motion capture actors should be paid residuals after a game is released. The strike went on for almost a year, and it became the longest strike in the Screen Actors Guild's history. There's also clearly two separate points of view at work here. One point of view is that the people who do the programming, modeling, and other development work are the true stars of the game, the ones who deserve the most recognition for their hard work, which can often involve long, stressful hours and weekends spent at work. The other point of view is that the actors who portray the characters in the game bring these characters to life, and that they're just as deserving of recognition for the artistic side of the game as the programmers are for the technical side. What do you guys think about all of this? Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time. By the way, I now have a Patreon page, so if you'd like to donate and support this channel further and get a few other special perks, I've added a link to it in the description below. Thank you.